I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversation. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. I just can't do it anymore. This is too much. Have you said that to yourself or have you heard that been said by someone in your life that's caring for others? How do we distinguish between a certain amount of normal stress and is this really burnout? Today we are talking about an important topic. My guest today is Debbie Compton. She became a full-time caregiver for three parents with three different forms of dementia. She used her problem-solving skills to develop new ways to make life more manageable. She is open and honest as we talk about what is caregiver burnout, what is happening, what am I experiencing, how do we recognize some of these emotions, what we can do to take action in response to burnout, move towards healing and managing that, and where we can go and look for support. Debbie is the founder of thepurplevine.com. She has authored several books, gives interactive speeches. She's an active community educator for the Alzheimer's Association, and we're so happy she's here with us today. This is my interview with Debbie Compton. Hi, Debbie. It's so nice to see you again. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I was looking forward to this conversation so much. This topic, gosh, it's so important. And just to feel supported and for us to talk about it, your mission is to really help and support caregivers. How did that come about for you? Uh, Yes, it is. It wasn't always. It wasn't even on my radar. Uh, I was in retail management and traveling coast to coast and uh, having a great time but as it turned out I was on the east coast when my dad who had Parkinson's and low blood pressure accidentally took my mother's pills who had vascular dementia and high blood pressure so he nearly went comatose and that was very stressful and then I was on the west coast when my mother passed out at the daily living center and had to be rushed to the hospital and I couldn't get there. I'm, I live in Oklahoma, by the way. Okay. So the coasts are a long ways away from me. <laughs> and, uh, and then the third time I was in Colorado when my mother-in-law locked herself out of her home in the middle of a snowstorm. And that's when we realized that there was a big issue going on with her because she did not even have the mental clarity to walk next door to the neighbor's house. She sat inside her car all day long for eight hours until her daughter got home from work. Mm. And so that's when we realized there were some real problems going on and somebody was going to have to step up and take care of them. They needed additional help. And so I became a three-time caregiver mm-hmm. all at once. Mm-hmm. All <laughs> at the same time. That's a all lot. at once. Yes. Yes. So thank heaven. It turned out, um, really well in the sense that I was used to managing teams that were located nationwide and problem solving and training and developing new ways of doing things. And so I used all those skills to, uh, to do the caregiving journey, which I was completely unprepared for. Mm -hmm. And so my mission is to help caregivers have an easier time than I had, because there are so many things that I learned that I wish I would have known at the beginning of the process to be able to mainly help my dad better. He was the first to pass Mm -hmm. and I just, I did the best I could, but I did a lot of things wrong. And I share that openly in my book as well so that people can learn. And also, so we don't beat ourselves up so much. I think as caregivers, we are historically tough on ourselves Mm -hmm. and we think everything has to be perfect and they need to look perfect and have their hair done and their glasses on and their teeth in, which is ideal, but it's, it's sometimes it's not realistic. Right. So I try to be that person to say, Hey, it's okay. Yeah. You got them there. Good job. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, we all need someone like you. I love that mm-hmm. what you were doing before really translated because it is when we care for our loved ones, we are essentially managing different teams of people in a way, right? We're managing yes. that care and we want things to flow easily and, and be successful at what we're doing. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I would never have predicted it, but it absolutely did worked out. Worked it out. Did. Yeah. This topic is so important and we hear the term quite frequently that caregiver burnout, but what does it actually really mean when we say that? I think we say it so much because we are overwhelmed and there's a lot going on, but if we're mm-hmm. really looking at what does that mean and are we addressing that actual mm-hmm. actual term when we speak about it? Right. Well, WebMD describes it as a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion that may be accompanied by a change in attitude from positive and caring to negative and unconcerned. And and that's really, it is, it's, it's total exhaustion. It's when you've been up all through the nights and you're taking care of them all day long too, and you're just really at the end of your rope. And it's something that that even psychologists don't take it lightly at all. Um, They say that it's a debilitating psychological condition brought about by unrelieved stress. And that's, that's everyone. Stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. When you have a small amount, it's great because it can propel you to do things. It can motivate you to move forward and, and to, you know, get away from harm, whatever the case may be. But the stress needs to then be relieved or to go away. And when you're a caregiver, especially if you're a caregiver of someone who you're keeping in your home 24 seven, the stress doesn't go away. And it's, it's unrelieved stress mm-hmm. unless you take actions and unless you are proactive to do something about it. Yeah, it is really unrelenting, especially yes. when you've got someone in your home that you have to find those moments of reprieve i hear caregivers say Mm -hmm. to me all the time of i just can't do it anymore this is too much right we we hit that point where we go i just can't even think straight because uh, this is so so overwhelming how was it for you when you were caring for your loved ones was there a personal experience that you had with burnout and how did you overcome that and and figure out ways to to manage it for yourself yes (laughs) all of the above yes (laughs) absolutely Uh, we moved my mother-in-law in with us and she had alzheimer's And unfortunately, she had the part of it that completely changed her personality, and she had drastic mood swings. She was the most precious, sweet, kindest little woman you would ever want to meet, never said a bad word about anyone, never said a cuss word. And all of a sudden, she is cussing at me, throwing things at me, and it's just, I'm just like, who is this person? You know, (laughs) what is happening? What's happening? (laughs) Yes. And so, um, and my husband was, had to go to work through the day and stuff, of course. So I would get up with her all through the night Mm. so that he could get some rest. So that meant that I was up with her all through the night and all through the day. And just as a little side point here too, as, uh, as caregivers, one of the best things we can do is learn to laugh Mm. because laughter does reduce stress. And Yes, I was up at 2.30 in the morning chasing my mother-in-law down the street when she was completely nude. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. But you know what? Hey, no yeah. one else was up. Right. It's okay. I got her back inside. Mm-hmm. It's fine. So that's the thing where you just, you got to laugh about it. Yes, it's horrible. It's mm-hmm. a, it's an awful disease. I'm not making light of the diseases at all. Right. I, I hate what they do to people. Mm-hmm. But we need to remember that that is not our loved one. That's the disease, Mm -hmm. not them. Mm -hmm. So there's my little sidetrack. But yes, um, I I was definitely facing caregiver burnout. I was exhausted. I didn't feel like I could go anymore. I was starting to lose my temper. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know what to do. And I I needed help, but I didn't know how to get it. And so in my particular case, uh, my son lives in North Carolina. So I scheduled a trip to go and visit with him because I'd already asked for help several times and everybody works and is busy and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure your caregivers understand what I'm talking about right there. So we'll just leave it there. Mm -hmm. You know, they have lives. Oh, we don't. (laughs) What about mine? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I scheduled a trip to go and see my son. And then I made out a schedule of where she would go, my mother-in-law and who she would stay with, which days. And so they each had her for about three days. And by the time I got back, 
there was a drastic change in their understanding wow. because now they saw it firsthand. They, they were all just astounded. They could not believe the things that she was doing because it's bizarre. Yeah. It is bizarre behavior. It is not rational. It, you can't rationalize with someone who has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to explain. And even when I would try to explain, you still don't really understand it until you walk a mile in those shoes and then you understand. And so that's what I did to create awareness and gain cooperation. Yeah. And it, it had a big impact. But hopefully your caregivers won't have to go to that drastic of a level. That's why I want to help them. Hey, let's, let's learn some steps, some things we can do before it gets that bad. Right. Yes. There's something to be said too about having people step in your shoes and see firsthand because then I think we really have that compassion. We can understand also how to support the people around us when we really know it's what's going on. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, there's a lot of people too that will say, um, let me know how I can help. And we as caregivers tend to say, okay, and we don't. Mm -hmm. We don't even think about it. We're just like, no, there's nothing they can do. There are loads of things they can do, mm -hmm. tons of things that they can do to help us. Mm -hmm. And you may want me to wait and get into that later. But yeah, anyway. yeah, I know we're going to get into all the things. Okay. <laughs> all the things. And how do we distinguish between a certain amount of normal stress that comes with life and what we do versus that burnout, the actual burnout? Well, because the normal stress can make you tense, but then you can relax mm. and then you can unwind from it. But caregiver burnout and also normal stress can be motivating, mm -hmm. can motivate you to do something, to get moving. But caregiver burnout is depressing. It's like a big, heavy, wet balloon or blanket falling down on you. It weights you down. You feel depressed. You feel angry, like um, your life doesn't matter anymore. You're just existing to take care of this other person. And it's, it's all negative emotions. Yeah that yeah. come into it. You mentioned some of the things we might experience with that burnout. What are some of the symptoms that we might not go, oh, that's that's what's happening here, <laughs> right? Some things to pay attention yes. to. Uh, yes. What are your thoughts Be on that? Because I didn't recognize that. Mm. And, and I came to learn if you're having a lot of headaches, stomach aches, and other physical problems, that can be a sign of caregiver burnout. If you're becoming unusually impatient, irritable, or argumentative, okay, that's because you're exhausted. Yeah. That is, that translates to caregiver burnout. Yeah. If you've just got this sense of overwhelming fatigue, you're, and that was really the biggest for me. I just, it was so hard for me to get up in the morning. I'd wake up in the morning and be exhausted when I first woke up. And it's because you don't get consistent sleep through the night, mm -hmm. or even if you do get some sleep, it's like you're sleeping with one eye open because you don't know what they're going to get into or what they're going to do. So you don't get that really restful sleep. Uh, it can be if you gain weight suddenly or suddenly lose weight, that can be a sign of it. Or if you're having trouble sleeping or you can't stay awake, you're mm -hmm. sleeping all the time. Those are all all symptoms of caregiver burnout. Um, and the, the big one, you know, is the depression or if you start to experience mood swings too and you're suddenly hearing yourself. I, I heard myself mm -hmm. becoming somewhat irrational, you know, because like I said, you can't, you can't reason with someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, any type of mental impairment. And if you find yourself trying to teach them something and going, come on, come on, focus. Okay. You've got the problem. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a hard one. It is, it is that short temper. It's like, Ooh, I, yeah, it is. It's yes. so much. Well, and we tend to judge ourselves too against caregivers who are paid, who are in a facility and they work eight hours, maybe 10 and then they go home mm. and they have a break from it and they can rest and they can come back refreshed the next day. It's a really good point. We don't, yeah. we don't get that when they're in your home, mm -hmm. but there are things you can do that we'll get into in a little yeah. while. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's mm -hmm. so true. They do have that, that ability to go home and take a break and have that rest uninterrupted. Yes. 
So yes. we, and a life. Yeah, and a life and things that they can go do and travel and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. We also hear the term, the compassion fatigue. How is that different than caregiver burnout? They're very, very similar. And I don't know really if there is a lot of difference mm -hmm. in the two because like they, a lot of times they'll, they'll call compassion fatigue, um, the negative cost of caring. Mm. And that's what it's oftentimes defined as. And it's the same thing. It's when you are giving your all and you've given until there's nothing left to give, then you're just exhausted. So we have to refill our own buckets first. Mm. And, and like with the airplane, you know, put your mask on first and then you can take care of someone else that never clicked for me for years mm -hmm. until I finally realized, okay, if I don't do a little bit more for myself, I'm not going to be any good for them. Right. Yeah. And I re remember hearing someone say too, that if we look at, and both people are very important in this dynamic, but if we look at the importance, that caregiver is right up there because without them, your loved one cannot thrive. And so right. we need that support and you need to be healthy and you need to be able to to have the capacity to care well and, and all of that. And we only do that by caring for ourselves first, which we're just going to write, encourage people to do that, to take the time yes. and to and to put yourself first. It's so important. And if we're recognizing, okay, we're feeling all of these things or we're identifying with what you're saying and we know we're headed down that path, how can we approach finding some help for ourselves? Okay, yes. Well, the very first thing sounds so simple, but it can be so difficult and it's just ask for help. Just ask. We are all surrounded by family and friends that are willing to help, but they don't know how. But if we take the initiative and say, for example, hey, can you come over and sit with my loved one, just watch a movie with them so I can go buy groceries in peace? I mean, that was a huge blessing for me mm -hmm. because I don't know if you've ever been grocery shopping with a little woman with Alzheimer's and another one with dementia. It's not fun. You know? <laughs> I know I would take the community I was working with. That was one of the things I was able to do was go grocery shopping. And it, it is uh, quite, quite interesting. A lot, a lot yes. going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hold on to the basket. Don't yeah. touch the baby. No, we don't know them. Put that back. We already have that. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so just to do that is a big help. Maybe you need somebody to mow the lawn. People will do that. And and so in my in my book, I talk about a number of different ways that people can help and ways that they can assist you because they're all around you. There's things that anybody can do. Maybe you want them to go buy the groceries. Um, maybe you want to go watch a movie. And, and some people who I know a lot of times it's hard to get someone to help. They don't, you know, they don't want to help. They're nervous about it. They'll tell you this one irritated me to no end. You're just better at it than I am. Well, you know what? It's because you're not trying. Yeah. <laughs> And I've had more practice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because someone has to do it. That's why I do it. Not because I enjoy doing this, right, you know? Right. So we need to, we need to be the one to say, Hey, you know, they always take a nap at this time of the day. If your loved one is on somewhat of a schedule, can you just sit at my house while I go run some errands? You know, anything like that is a big help. And then we've got, you've got tons of groups that are there to help you as well. And if you, there are things that you can do if you're a sole care, caregiver and you're alone in your home, there are still things that you can do to take care of yourself. Doing things proactively versus reactively. What are some yes. of the things, or is it not even separated like that as I'm talking through it? <laughs> right? if, we're, if we're anticipating burnouts coming and then mm -hmm. we need to, then in response to the burnout, things that we can do to, to get out of that and to start healing a little bit more. Yes, yes. And and I will be real honest with you too. I, I feel a little bit hypocritical talking to people about caregiver burnout because I struggled with it too. And, and I still, and next, but now the knowledge is here. Yeah. So now it's a matter of applying everything and I have gotten tremendously better at it, mm -hmm. but the things, there are things that we can do and it's little things. If you like to get out and go for a walk, take your loved one for a walk. If they can't walk, put it, put them in the wheelchair, push them around. That's what I did with my mother-in-law. We'd go for walks all the time because I'd put her in the wheelchair and push her 
She loved getting outside. They, you know, most people, it depends on how your person is. Mm -hmm. um, she loved gardening. So she would sit on the swing and watch me while I gardened. And then she'd help occasionally and, you know, pull up my flowers instead of the weeds. And yeah, you know, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. She used to be a great gardener who just, you know, things change. But, um, but yes, I would encourage that you start early and start planning things for yourself. A, plan a little break for yourself, whether it's to go get a massage or if it's to soak in a hot tub. You can have a teenager come over and watch TV with them if, if that's their thing. If it's sitting on the swing, if it's reading a book, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But you can, you know, you can, if you have to hire them, you can hire someone to come and do it. But if you ask at your church, you can oftentimes find someone who is a senior who's lonely and would be happy to come and sit with your loved one mm -hmm. and visit with them while you have a little break. If your little break is still staying at the home to make sure everything is okay, but maybe you're soaking in the hot tub or you're in another room reading a book. It's that little bit of quiet time that really helps. That's what helped me immensely mm -hmm. was finally inviting people over and having them just visit with mom and with, with my mother-in-law or whoever, you know, just talk to them and I would go off and do something else. And that was a huge relief to me. And there are other things that you can do as well. You can take a nap when they take a nap. Don't worry about the dishes so much. They'll be there. Just rest. Get, the, get some extra rest that you need. You can go on Facebook. There's a number of support groups and things that are there to, so that you can talk to someone who's going through the same type of issue that you are and shared you know, they may have some information that you hadn't thought of. They may have a technique that you hadn't thought of that will help. Even the act of taking a few deep breaths, just breathing really deep in through your nose, holding it for a few seconds and releasing out through your mouth, that will help reduce the tension and reduce the stress. You can do that at any point in time. When you're in the middle of the day and you feel yourself tightening up, I would encourage you to stop and just take some deep breaths to lower the tension levels down and to help you be able to respond. And music helps a lot. If you're having trouble with your loved one, if they're irritable, put on their style of music that they enjoy and play that. That can dramatically change the mood and lift the mood. If you like essential oils, you can put in peace and calming, lavender, some of these others that help induce calm, help bring about calm. So there's just, you know, I would encourage you just get creative with it because there's a lot you can do and everybody has their own thing that's going to work out best for them. But just take a moment, sit and think about it and then write them down because you're busy. Life is crazy. <laughs> write it down and then you'll remember to start doing those things. Yeah. I like that idea of writing it down when we're stressed. I think we tend to not write, maybe think or see clearly. And looking at what the things that bring us joy and bring us peace, because that is unique for each person. So I like how mm -hmm. you talked about really looking at what works for you and what might work for me is different than somebody else. And we say that term, the silver lining of COVID, but it's true because it normalized doing some things online or outsourcing that we didn't maybe take advantage of before. So having groceries mm -hmm. delivered or mm -hmm. hiring someone to uh, take on certain tasks and and being open to changing. Oh, we've always maybe done it this one way in our life. Mm -hmm. And now looking at what do I ha not have the capacity for? The other day it was, I had a really, really busy week caregiving in a different way and just didn't have the capacity to go to the grocery store. I was like, I don't have that, that hour to walk through the aisles to think about what I mm -hmm. need. And I ordered groceries online and I don't normally do that. But it for me, it relieved a level of stress that I needed at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so being open to, to change and doing some things that are different for yourself too is, is so helpful. I, oh, I think so. And the change is good for our loved one too. You know, maybe they want you to go somewhere for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> They're probably sometimes just as think, over us. <laughs> you know, sometimes we don't think about that, but you know, they may be tired of you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so true. So true. 
uh, mm-hmm. well, there's things we can do. And, and if we're like, oh gosh, this is really concerning me. And I, I feel like I need to take some action. Where do we start and where do we look for that support and those resources available? Well, I would suggest first off that you go to family and friends and talk to them, be open with them and honest and just tell them, hey, I am exhausted and I need some help. Can you help me? And if they say, well, sure, or they're hesitant or whatever they say, be prepared with a list of things that they could do to help you and then let them choose. And one thing that, um, that I did as well is to say, would you like to do this or this? And, and if you notice, I didn't say, would you help me? I said, which one do you want to do? I like that. Yeah. Very, <laughs> would you prefer direct. to do this or this? That's a, that's a good one mm-hmm. to help you. Um, but you can also go to alz.org. That's the Alzheimer's organization website. There's tons of caregiver information and things on there. You can also use aging services. They have a lot of free information on that. Check with your church. As I said before, your, uh, your local church has oftentimes senior groups and sometimes support groups. It just varies, but you can uh, chat with some people there and you may find some lonely people that were more than willing to come over and sit with your loved one to give you a break. I mentioned earlier there are Facebook support groups also. My website has a lot of information on it as well. That's thepurplevine.com and I have a blog and some resources and different things and they could sign up for the email list there as well. On that you get one email a day for the first five days just so that we can kind of get acquainted better and then you just get one a week because I don't like the bombarding people and I know that people don't have time So for me, one a week with some tips or some pointers or ideas is the, is the good solution. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, if they're interested, that will help out too. But there's a lot of help out there. You can also check with DHS, go just do a search online and search for senior activities. There's so much help that people just don't know about. There are people that provide rides for seniors. They will take them to doctor's visits and back and forth and places like that. I personally never utilize those because I always wanted to be there. But depending on the need, maybe that maybe that fits the need. And my mother was, um, and still is, a very social person. And so she went to the Daily Living Center. And they would pick her up in a limousine. So she was just, woohoo. <laughs> So they'd pick her up at the limousine, take her to the daily living center where she would spend the day and they'd bring her back home about 3.30 every day. And it was perfect. And it didn't cost a dime because of her income level. So there are a lot of things that are available depending on income level that that kind of sets the pace for what it is that you qualify for as free as the income. And it's not your income it's their income. Okay. That's so good to know. And I think that is a concern for people is I don't have the financial resources to pay for all of these quote unquote extra things, even though we know they're necessary and vital, but to look at some of those benefits. And there's another one, another company that I just love called Papa, and they are care companions that come into your home or take your loved one for Mm -hmm. rides and you could be there, you could not be there, but those are also offered with some benefit plans as well to have so many hours of that support. So it's so important now. I think, you know, we're shifting in what we're doing of how we can support caregivers and, and what services Mm -hmm. are being offered. So that's a great idea to look at that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and Visiting Angels is another one where they come in and they will do whatever needs to be done. And there are a number of home services that are just popping up now and really expanding. And part of that is because the baby boomers are aging and they see that the numbers of people with Alzheimer's and dementia is going to increase dramatically as we age, because that's the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's, by the way. age is the number one. The older you get, the greater your odds are of getting it. And we're living longer. So more people are getting it. Mm -hmm. And so it's great that these companies are being proactive and putting their services out there. And many are free. You, you just have to search to find them. Yeah. I think just the encouragement for people to look at what's out there and find, Uh find those people, be connected, 
know that there is that support and help and the ability to go look for it that some of them can be covered yeah I that is one of the number one concerns I feel like people have is I don't have the money to pay for and even those typical quote-unquote self-care services that we that we we think of which could be massage or um, uh-huh. manicure or things that things that might cost a little bit of money but know that it is you're investing in yourself and, and in your mental health yes well and for people who don't you know they're not really that social don't want to get out and talk to other people I um, I wrote a book and the reason that I wrote the book was I had hospice here in our home and they were helping and that's a free service by the way but they were coming in and helping with my mother-in-law at the very end. And they saw some of the things that I had done to make life safer. And they were like, wow, where did you read about that? And I said, nowhere. It's called survival. <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> I was in the school of learning as I go. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And, they, and the hospice nurses were the ones that said, people need to know about this. They said, that'll, that'll help other people. You need to tell people about this. And so I prayed about it and thought about it and dwelled on it for a while. And that's why I wrote Caregiving, How to Hold On While Letting Go. Mm. Because in that, it talks about the questions that when we started, I didn't even know I needed to ask. I didn't know what the questions were. And so it tells you the questions to ask the doctor, the questions to ask healthcare professionals. If you're looking for someone to come in the home and help, things that you ask for them, and then ways to deal with with the issues that you're facing. Because what I found is I did tons of research. I found a lot of information about the steps and stages of the disease. So what I found was that when dad was in the middle of having a hallucination, it really wasn't important to me what was going on in his brain and what was causing it. I wanted to know how to deal with it. What is it that I need to do? And I had a hard time finding that. And so that's some of the information that I included in my book. Plus I have two brothers and a sister. We handle our parents differently. Mm. And so my way of dealing with mom, who's going through the constant, we call it, I call it loop de loop because she's just repeating, repeating, repeating. Mm -hmm. And so I handle it one way, whereas my older brother handles it differently. My sister does differently and my younger brother does it yet a different way. So there's four different ways (laughs) to deal with it that I include in the book because it's not one size fits all. And we were not all the same before we got dementia. So why would we think we're all the same once we have it? We're still individuals. And so one of the main things too that I really encourage caregivers to do is learn your person, learn their likes and dislikes, learn what kind of food they like, learn what movies they like to watch, all these things because they'll lose the ability to communicate that with you and you want to be able to know it. So again, that's in um, caregiving, how to hold on while letting go, tells you about all these things and gives you a bunch of different ideas because you don't just need a plan A or a plan B, you need an A, B, C, D. So. (laughs) We do and and adjust and then try again and reapproach and all of those things. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you wrote that. And you know, those lived life experiences are invaluable. We learn so much and you're able to pass on what you wish you would have known and support those families. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It was, it it was a God thing. That was not my plan, but you know, and that's every, every book that I've written is because of family. I'm very family oriented and I wrote uh, sunshine for the soul. It's S O N sunshine for the soul. And I wrote that because my mother loves to read and reading is a great way to keep the mind connected with the words. And so I made it large print so that she could see it. And, and then it has, um, it'll have a quote from a famous person, anybody from Billy Graham to Dr. Seuss, Mm. (laughs) but it's an inspirational quote. Then it'll have a Bible verse. And then it has a funny true story from our lives. And there are tons of those. And a whole lot of them were about my mom because my dad was a preacher and pastored these small country churches. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but when you're in a small country church and there's a job that has to be done and no one else wants to do it, the preacher's wife gets to do it. (laughs) Yes. I can imagine. Yes. Yes. So my mother became the bulletin maker. She's not a writer. 
but and she had to do it in the time with a typewriter with no autocorrect, no spell check, none of that fun stuff. And she also had four children at home. So I can only imagine. Oh, I mean, pressure. by the time yeah. Oh, yeah. And by the time you get to the bottom of it and you make a mistake, oh, man. it's like, mm, is it really worth going back and doing right. it all over again to right. fix that? Or is it okay? Hope no one notices that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So when my dad passed away, I found his briefcase and it was full of these old bulletins that he had kept. And they were just hilarious. <laughs> Some of them were so funny. And I thought, oh, I have to share these. Yeah. Because one letter, if you ever get to feeling like you don't make a difference, I'll tell you how one letter makes a big difference. Mm. She left out the first G in the word singing. So the bulletin says, if you enjoy sinning, <laughs> join the choir. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that yeah. is like a major G in that word. <laughs> yes, yes. Aww. So it's so fun. But it was the only book she read for about a year. Mm. Because it, and she just thought that lady was so funny. She didn't realize it was her, but it was so cute. So that's why I wrote that. And then I made a couple of um, coloring books for adults because I was with mom and we were coloring and she colored this, we were at a daily living center and she colored this dog blue and this little lady started yelling at her. Oh, wow. You know, why did you do that? Dogs are not blue. That's not the way that goes. And I was frustrated, but there's not a lot I could say because that sweet little lady had her own issues going on. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was then I created coloring books that have mandalas or swirls and patterns to them because there is no right or wrong. Yeah. Mom can color whatever color she wants and nobody can say it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So that's why I made Color Me Calm and Faith Lives Here. And, uh, and the faith lives here has Bible verses in the middle or an inspirational quote that she'll read like 30 times while she's coloring that page. Oh, it's so, so that's meditative too for her, I bet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. And then um, for the caregivers, I wrote right to remember. It's W-R-I-T-E, right to remember. And it's a journal and it's a fat little journal. It has plenty of room to write. There are no dated pages because we don't need extra pressure. Yeah, right. you, you, can, you can write whenever you want. You don't have to write if you don't. Aww. But it gives you plenty of room because, again, life is funny. And we need to learn to laugh about these things. So when you find, and I've given you a number of examples of things that were, you could either stress about or you can laugh about. So choose to laugh. And write those things down because then one day you'll be able to laugh a lot more and it'll become a cherished memory. Yeah. So, so write to remember lets you write that down. It lets you write down questions, spaces. It's got plenty of information to record, to-do lists, doctor notes, whatever you want. Whatever you want within the pages. And it has some inspirational little sayings through it too to help. The, that's the whole focus of my life is supporting caregivers and, and the care receivers as well and help them live their best life possible and to help the caregiver just remember you're doing a great job you are keeping them alive you are doing what most people don't want to do and you probably didn't choose it you will reap rewards for it such a hopeful message and one everyone needs to hear so thank you so much for sharing that with us today and i love the non-dated writing i always <laughs> dreamed of being a journaler i thought oh this is going to be so great and i would not yeah. journal for months at a time and then feel bad that i didn't journal and right. so <laughs> you take yes. the pressure off i i love that thank yes. you <laughs> yeah no problem i know because then it can be depressing i tried the same thing mm -hmm. and then it's like uh I missed a couple of weeks. I might right. as well forget it now. Exactly. Well, no, no dates. No dates. It could have been yesterday. Yeah. No one knows. There's freedom in that. <laughs> There's freedom. Thank you, yes. Debbie. I've loved our conversation. And I just, everyone go to your her website, which is thepurplevine.com. You can find all of her information and books and connect with Debbie. And we're just... So happy you could be here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I've enjoyed talking with you. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. <laughs> In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.